But he yeah. was going quite fast. Yeah. Hello, geez. Yes. He's got oh, to really? say about it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Lots to say. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and this is the next video in our Ride Along series uh, where Jordan Clark and I are meeting up with uh, Leonard Nout in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And Leonard takes us around uh, for a rather comprehensive ride, looking at infrastructure and talking about ways that uh, other cities around the globe, including North America, can become more bicycle friendly and create an environment that is more people oriented and people friendly. And it is a long one. So be prepared for that. And it's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Enjoy. Hi, uh, my name is Leonard Nout. I'm the manager of international strategy with Mobicon, a sustainable mobility advisory firm here based in the Netherlands. So Leonard, why don't you uh, repeat what you were saying about this canal? So the canal will be reinstated from here all the way to the city center. A continuous waterway where you can drive a boat through the tunnel. Um, and then the streets on either side will be reinstated to the old grid with apartment buildings filling the gaps where currently only traffic uh, sits. Fantastic. And then uh, behind you is, is this massive roadway. What were you saying is gonna happen to that? Uh, they're gonna put an apart apartment building right in the middle uh, and then reinstate the roads either side with just single lane uh, roads. So no, not really a through road anymore, but more of an access road to the apartment building. Uh, cycleway is still gonna go through there crossover and towards the tunnel um, and then one apartment building over there and one apartment building over here in front of the old uh, light support apartment building which I think is lovely. And then the road itself is going to be going through a road diet of some yeah. sort? A significant road diet currently it's two to four to six lanes it's going to go down to two maximum but fairly continuous take out some of the traffic lights uh, still have a decent flow of traffic going into the city but not nearly as much as it is now. Fantastic I love it. Tricky project. Yeah. So the canal will be going right through there and getting reconnected. We're uh, standing in front of our, our little uh, coffee spot here where we uh, met up and uh, did our master planning for today. So what do you have in store for us here, uh, Leonard? It is the good, the bad, and the ugly tour. We're going to uh, see some good, some is going to be good but is not good yet, and then some this is really bad and how do we fix it uh, stuff. So yeah, a little bit of everything. Not the prettiest parts of Utrecht necessarily, but you know, telling the, the truth. <laughs> Showing you the real side of Utrecht as well. Fantastic. All right, looking cool. forward to it. Awesome. All right, Let's here roll. we go. And we are rolling. Let's go check out Utrecht with Leonard Nout and Jordan Clark. Here we go. All right, bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. Woo! Keeping it slow. So was that by design right there? Oh yeah. That bumpiness? Poor maintenance is a great traffic calming feature. <laughs> Poor maintenance is a great uh, calming. Slows you down. Traffic calming <laughs> is right. <laughs> Going to turn left over here. You can see these little crossing features because of the schools around. Yeah. Doesn't do much, but just looks I nice. was going to say, yeah, those look like candy canes, right, yeah. Jordan? <laughs> or like a barbershop. Uh, <laughs> barbershop, yeah. Yeah. I like it. It depends on the season, you know. Depends on, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. These nice old streets. Yeah. There we go again. Fairly narrow. Ah. A little picnic delivery. Yeah. Now we're heading to the bicycle street along the train tracks. This was built to connect the city to the new neighborhood of Leitzerein, which is uh, about two, three miles in this direction. Um, and they upgraded this street to a bicycle street because they felt that there was going to be such a high volume of cyclists that they needed to cater them to, to get to the central station. And this used to be a normal residential street. And now you can see 
still looks very similar except they have red asphalt instead of uh, cobblestones they put some clever uh, traffic circulation measures into one-way sections and um, and uh, little modal filters so you can't drive the whole length of the street which means that the the number of cars has significantly reduced and there's just a lot of people cycling it's currently very quiet because it's what half past 11 on a Friday, yeah, probably the quietest time of the week, but normally this is uh, teeming with cyclists uh, cycling up and down. So nice asphalt, but still quite slow because of the mm -hmm. speed bumps along the way, speed tables. Yeah. It's just a and much more way. comfortable for us for on sure. bikes, on these yeah. skinny little tires, yeah. uh, to be able to navigate this, uh, this asphalt compared to the uh, the stones and the cobbles that we were just on. For sure. Yeah. 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 It's a pretty similar approach we use for the bike network as for the car network. So the, the long continuous ones you want to have in red asphalt mm -hmm. where people can cycle a little bit faster. But also for bicycles once they turn into the residential streets there's really no need to go that fast. So, um, that's why we don't mind having a bit more discomfort on the cobblestone streets where people live. It's a, and it's a nice sign, like it's very easy to navigate all the way to the new neighborhood uh, by just following the red asphalt basically. Right. You don't need a signposting or wayfinding at all. Yeah, that's a good point because if it were in the curvy neighborhood streets, yeah. you'd probably you'd be, like, oh, be weaving it? in and out and yeah. trying to get to uh, the location where yeah. taking this, uh, this exactly. street and uh, and did you say this used to be a railway corridor or? Uh, no, the railway is just uh, Oh, the, it's parallel. right there on yeah. the other side yeah. of the trees. Right. Yeah, I so see So they have a little park in between. Right. Some community gardens there is nice yeah. as well. Um, Very nice. Leftover space. But this, yeah, this street has really turned around quite a lot. It was quite a, well, not a rundown, but a very run of the mill. And now it's actually a very pleasant street. Right. Lots of people going by, so it feels very safe. And you have uh, quite a nice view. Uh, out your front door and a nice sound barrier from the train so I actually don't hear it that much. Oh. Oh. Yeah, the sound barrier makes such a big difference. Yeah. So you can hear it but it's not very loud. Yeah, that's, to live on this that's a really good yeah, good right. point. Is you know, it's it uh, that sound barrier really muffled mm. the yeah. noise of that, and yeah. yet, as you can see from that video clip, it, the sound barrier isn't that yeah. that no. tall. I mean, it's, it's still the, uh, you can still see the train. Yeah, yeah. It's probably like a meter and a half. Yeah. I'm gonna turn right here. pull off over here. So you can see the sign for the construction um, announcement. So this is currently still a four lane road and they're in stages they're taking it down to two lanes, one lane each direction and um, putting a bigger grass median in the middle. I don't think they're widening the cycleways actually, I think they're remaining the same width but just adding more greenery, more permeable uh, surface to the, to the street uh, and taking out some traffic lights along the way. So I found that the traffic lights are really the one thing that's causing delay on the corridor like this. So by taking it down to one lane, you can remove the traffic lights, have a very continuous flow of cars, all traveling at the same speed, no overtaking, no crazy shenanigans, just a continuous flow um, of cars, which makes it very easy to drive um, and yet much less space taken up than it is uh, currently taking up. So it's a, one of the bigger projects, very contentious. We'll see along the way the different stages of construction, but at the end you also see how big of a difference it already makes uh, in terms of sound, in terms of emissions as well, um, and just in terms of what it looks like, because it's uh, currently a very unattractive uh, street. Yeah, going to be a lot better. But this is pushing the boundaries a little bit because it is very high in traffic volume for a one-lane street. Uh, but by taking the traffic lights out, they still can maintain a pretty good level of service, probably slightly less than what it is now. So there will be some delay, but they accept the delay. 
And the, the alderman for transport actually went out in the newspaper and said, yeah, the, the, the rights of the people that live on this street for good quality air uh, and being able to cross the street just uh, supersedes the right of the people to drive through the street. So I find the, the residents more important than the commuters going in and out which is why I accept that there'll be more delay and we'll just have to deal with it. Which I think is an awesome statement that you don't see that explicitly very much, not even in the Netherlands. Yeah. And she's a really a forerunner in that, uh, in, the, in, in that space. Yeah, that's great. Mm. New intercity trains. Finally. They're not in service yet. They'll be uh, introduced in December, I think. So on the right, they're building a whole new neighborhood. Okay. I'm not sure how many houses, but a lot of houses. Yeah. Uh, which is also why this street, they want to downgrade it to make it better accessible right. for this neighborhood. And because the housing shortage is uh, very real in, uh, in Utah. Prices are out of control. You can see they're already quite far, some of them. But this all used to be a rail yard and uh, okay. light industrial uh, space. A detour. It's an arterial road with still two lanes of parking on mm -hmm. one side. Yeah. Just by building this boulevardy kind of treatment with a separate access road that's only really used for parking and access to the houses. You separate that from the through traffic, which is beneficial in two ways. It's better for, for cycling because you do have a separate space while still being able to provide uh, parking for the houses uh, in this neighborhood. You can tell it's quite bumpy at the moment, but after this is done, I'm sure they'll repave this side as well to be uh, right. more smooth. To make that transformation yeah. from bricks to red asphalt. Yes. I also note how comfortable it is uh, with the trees here too. Yeah. The trees make such a big difference. Yeah. yeah. And you can imagine with a bigger median, with another row of trees in the median, mm -hmm. it'll be even better. Yeah. Uh, and only one lane of traffic, obviously, which is going to be a game changer. So here you can see the transformation, two lanes behind us and then one lane in front of us. And it's almost hard to imagine how they could have squeezed two more lanes out of the cross section that we're about to uh, ride into, but it was there. So this, believe it or not, was four lanes. Um, so the grass or the, 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 the open median wasn't there. These little buffer strips were in there. It was a pedestrian fence along each side to stop people from crossing. And then four lanes of traffic in the middle. Um, so this is where it's gonna be another row of trees in the center and rows of trees on either side in the, in the, in the, in the verge. Um, but you can already notice a lot calmer, more steady stream. There's no overtaking, so everybody drives the same speed. 
which means that the slowest vehicle dictates the speed of all the cars. Right? If you have two lanes, you invite people to overtake. If one person drives 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, people will just race and overtake and do maybe 40 miles an hour. If you have one lane of traffic and one person drives 25, everybody else drives 25. So it's a very consistent, easy, uh, less noise, less overtaking, less crazy uh, driver behavior. So it's a lot of benefits to having a one lane over a two lane um, roadway. And what's the driver motor vehicle count that you can easily accomplish with this type of design with one lane yeah. in each direction? It depends a little bit on the intersection configuration. Right. If you take out a lot of traffic lights, it can be up to 14,000, 15,000 a day, okay. which is quite a lot. Uh, if you do have some traffic lights or a lot of crossing points where you have priority for pedestrians, for example, which they don't do here, right? This is quite mm -hmm. high in the volume already. Then it's usually 10, 12 uh, is about the the operational maximum. So there's a few factors that influence it, but it can be quite a lot, mm -hmm. uh, more than people expect. Right. Because it's a, and, and then the, looking yeah. and then looking at the entire system, yeah. uh, and the fact that we're going to have two-way cycle paths on either side of the street. Yeah. Yeah. How many do you expect that you could accomplish and handle on those <laughs> those, those two-way uh, cycle paths? Ooh. Uh, Thousands, <laughs> tens yeah. of thousands, tens probably. of the way, way more, like yeah, a two yeah. X. Way, way, way more. We yeah. have one street just around the corner, yeah. uh, which currently has about thirteen thousand vehicles a day on one lane yeah. in cars. Yeah. About twenty thousand bikes yeah. a day on two, two meter, so six foot wide bikeways. Right. Um, so that's already, and it could be much more if you if you need to uh, yeah. need to push it. So, so, yeah. so the lesson being is that the these cycle paths, if designed well and wide enough, yeah. Can can really you know yeah. exponentially increase how many people you can exactly. move through a, yeah. a corridor. Vastly more efficient. Yeah. Vastly more. If you're looking for efficiency, you want more of the cycleways and fewer of the roads for right. sure. Yeah. And one other thing is that crossing one lane at a time mm -hmm. is significantly easier than crossing two lanes at a time or mm -hmm. four lanes at a time, um, which makes uh, it less. Uh, crucial that there is pedestrian priority, right? These these sections don't have pedestrian priority because we prioritize car flow on this road. Um, but at the same time, we give pedestrians a crossing distance of 10 foot. So it's much, much less exposure to car traffic than if you would have a 20 foot or 25 foot or 40 foot crossing, in which case it's almost impossible to cross by yourself. One lane at a time, most people can safely accomplish crossing. That's a nice little feature. Yeah. This was built in like four weeks, maybe? Yeah. It was quick. It was so quick. And so you say this is built in, in like four weeks time, very quick. Is that, a, is that a statement quick for Netherlands standards or just quick for uh, globally? Yeah, I, definitely quick globally. Maybe it was a little bit more than four weeks, but it felt very, very fast for a major project like this. Right. I don't think they redid all the drainage and stuff because that usually takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, but the repaving and going from four lanes to two was, was an exceptionally quick project, largely uh, because of all the pre-cast elements that we use. So there's a lot less concrete to be poured and boxes to be built and yeah. all that kind of stuff. This whole intersection, you can see all the little elements in the curbs. That's all just bought on a web shop, right. literally, um, where you can say, I want a little detail, one meter piece of curb, yeah. they just ship it to you on a truck. You put it in place, pour a little bit of asphalt in the middle, and you're done. Yeah. Um, and then compared to a US context, where for each of these islands, two guys have to build a box that's exactly the right shape, hammer it into place with wood, the casing and stuff, then put the put the steel wiring in for the inter for the for the concrete. It takes days and days, and this takes a few guys probably half a day to build a whole island. Interesting, the intersection's open. So they just opened this intersection. This used to be a double lane signalized roundabout. Now they took all the traffic lights out. This was always a bit of a gamble. We'll see how it works. Looks a little bit chaotic at the moment with a few giant trucks. <laughs> but it's uh, 
interesting proposition. So as you can see, we do have priority as bikes along the, the main road, not across. So bikes have to cross by themselves. Um, cars turning have to give way when they're crossing the main axis, which is east-west. Um, so there will be full priority along this road because that's where the road was taken from four lanes to two. So they want to prioritize it to make sure the capacity stays to a certain minimum required level. But there is a lot of people crossing in this direction currently, which they want to discourage. Um, hence why they give way. So it's kind of a self-managing system by, in, in that sense, where they're trying to encourage behavior change just by making it slightly less convenient to drive in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. and it used to be a traffic light, so it was every movement got a certain number of seconds of green time. Now it's a, we made a decision, east-west is more important, north-south is less important, so we have to, people have to find other ways to get around. So to some American traffic engineers, they might think this is a bad situation with bad level of service, but that's the point. I would say that's worth saying again without the loud truck. Uh, <laughs> to an American traffic engineer, this might look like a bad level of service, but here that's the point of the, the intersection. They changed it to make it less convenient in a certain direction to get people to behave in a different way. It's brilliant. It's interesting. It, it's it's uh, like it's uh, an elongated peanut. It is an elongated peanut, yeah. So this is a larger version of the thing we're trying to build in uh, Colorado at the moment, mm -hmm. um, which is a much less busy road, so it's not going to be as chaotic as this, but uh, the same principles apply. So it'll be interesting to see how this functions in a, an American context. Yeah. Well, what's interesting too is you can totally see there's just a little bit of apprehension from a driver behavior perspective with some of the drivers even like slowly kind of yielding and, yeah. and, and not yielding to anybody. They're just trying to like work it out in their mind yeah. as to what they should be doing. I think this literally opened this week, so it's very, yeah. very new. So a yeah. lot of these drivers will see this for the first time. Yeah, um, yeah. It'll be interesting yeah. to see how this operates in yeah. three months for sure. <laughs> Tennessee yeah. people still have used cycle to it. priority but but see even with with a new with, this is what I like about this kind of intersection even if it's new for everybody mm -hmm. the first thing they do is take their foot of the gas right so it's slow right so it's instantly safe right because it's so slow even if people are confused about who has right-of-way or whatever it, it, in the end at the end of the day that doesn't even really matter because everybody's just going three miles an hour. Correct. And even if you do have a fender bender here or there, yeah. it's like, it's a huge difference between a tiny little fender bender and a yeah. higher speed yeah. fatality. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. A crash. And it's physically impossible to have a high speed at this uh, intersection at the moment. At so. this point. Well, I'm sure some motorist will find They'll a way. try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It looks closed, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it's closed for us. But even if you have a traffic jam here, it will resolve itself very quickly, right? Because once, once one movement has flow again, they'll just keep going. Pretty intuitive and easy. Yeah, that's pretty easy. Oh, uh, we'll go there. Okay. That's nice. So I bet. I bet people will be complaining about this because they have to wait, because they instantly forgot that there was a traffic light, Right. where they probably had to wait a lot longer, but it used to be a traffic light telling them not right. to go, and right. now it's just other people. So they'll get grumpy about other people blocking their path for a while, right. while forgetting that it was a, the same delay, or probably more before, right. which is well, it's, be interesting It's a little dynamic. bit of the amnesia of, yeah. of signalized traffic intersections, yeah. is like yeah. you're, 
you know, you, you just, you, it says red, so you stop and you wait and then you kind of lose track of yeah. time yeah. and then you yeah. get your green and you go. And you're like, yes. Whereas, you know, in a roundabout or yeah. some sort of modified yeah. uh, roundabout type situation yeah. like that, where you actually have to, you to know, negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> Look at people, talk yes. to people. People will get in your way, yes. but that's all part of the fun. <laughs> People. Yeah, sure. People. <laughs> People. Gross. It was actually a roundabout, a very large square about. Yeah, I was just going to say that was kind of a, a rectangular about, a, a, rec a square exactly. about. A very large one. <laughs> a very it large one. It works well, but it's uh, excessively large. Ooh. Ooh, it's a bit tight. <laughs> Yeah, so we still have a lot beautiful, of this kind beautiful of center area here. Yeah. Walking path through yeah. mature trees. It's actually a linear park that kind of works. Yeah. You don't see that very often. Yeah. Um, with a stamped dirt path in the middle. Uh -huh. A lot of people walking their dogs and yeah. But that's yeah, that's how much width you need for a linear park to actually work that way. Right. Quite a lot. Again, in, in Active Town's you know terminology, it's mm. it's a beloved activity asset. A beloved activity asset. Nice. You're able to get a little bit of greenery in, yeah. take the doggy for a walk, or yeah. go for your run, yeah. and not have to necessarily be on a harder surface. Yeah. Mixing it up with motor vehicles. Heavy buses. Quite nice. Quite nice. And electric articulated buses. Yeah. Which are very quiet. They just sneak up on you from behind. Yes, that is so true, yeah. You'll probably appreciate that in the video that uh, <laughs> yeah. those electric articulated buses on that little edge lane road treatment that we have here, where pretty much we're just separated from the, yeah. that quiet electric bus by a little painted line. Uh, yeah, probably not the infrastructure choices that we would make now if we had to redesign this road. Mm -hmm. We could probably flip the parking and right. have the bike lane protected by the parking. So there's still a lot of this kind of legacy infrastructure, even in Utrecht. Yeah. And slowly tinkering away at all those roads. But yeah, it is an expensive exercise that's uh, yeah. taking decades. Still, uh, it's still not perfect by any means. Well, and I think no that's an important. Is. It's an important point to make is that. Um, when we look at the Dutch reality, is yeah, no, it's not all perfect. There are some legacy stuff that needs to be changed, and yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> even something as simple as that little plug that we just passed, yeah. the electric uh, plug, you know, poking yeah. out yeah, of yeah, the yeah. car into the yeah. bike lane yeah. area here. You know, yeah, the work sure. is never done. The work is never finished. No, yes. no city is ever done. If yes. the city is done, you're in trouble. Yes. Yeah. Literally, if the city is done, that probably means it's, you're cooked. You're done. <laughs> you're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And here you can see a little bit yeah. of so then separation they, they now. They did spend money on the intersection yep. where it matters. Right? So no edge lane roads here. Full separation, bi-directional cycleway, full bike priority. We're going to turn right here and cross the bridge. Yeah. That's a... That's also, I think, an important lesson. You don't have to have perfect uh, separated bikeways everywhere before you start fixing your intersections. Right. I actually recommend doing the other way around. If you have limited budget, start fixing your intersections first, because that's where a lot of the crashes happen um, and where the most injuries are, are found. Excellent yeah. point. And what we just witnessed there with the roundabout, mm. speaking about injuries and crashes, to our point earlier, is yeah. that that's one of the things that you can do to decrease the number of serious yeah. crashes and injury crashes, collisions, is to do the roundabout. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And to do it properly. To do it properly. Exactly. <laughs> Big caveat there. Not the standard American roundabout. Not the standard the proper, American roundabout. Proper roundabout, as we called it. So something like this. Although this has a bi-directional cycleway, which I wouldn't generally recommend in a U.S. context. Right. Where it kind of works. Um, but yeah, enough space for cars to pull out. 
um, people can see each other, uh, people can anticipate each other's movements, and everybody travels uh, relatively slowly. Like the operating speed will be 15, 20 miles an hour, which just gives you a lot of space and time to react. Right. Right. At a, if you're driving on the road with 50 miles an hour and there's a pedestrian crossing, it's really hard to react quickly enough, slam on the brakes, and stop in time to let somebody cross. So it's almost unfeasible to ask that of drivers. Right. It's one of the things of Dutch design is that we make it easy for drivers to behave appropriately. Right. And that's, I think, a very important point that you don't just make a rule and expect people to follow that rule regardless of the environment. You have to create the environment that the easiest thing is to follow the rule. Right. And that makes everything a lot easier, less enforcement, fewer crashes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot nicer for everybody. I'm going to turn right down here. Actually, the former prostitution area. <laughs> What's that? The, this is the prostitution area. Oh, okay. Where they're building a new prostitution place. It's kind of weird. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. To each his own, I guess. Each to his own. Yeah. yeah. This is lovely again. Yes. Right. From a quiet, high stress, high car environment. Now we're basically at the edge of the city and so this is already from the train station to here 15 minutes and you're out of, out of the city. You can see a paddock <laughs> with some storks, storks in it? Yeah, storks. Oh yeah, the big storks over there. And, and this is technically a 60 kilometer per hour zone, so 40 miles an hour, so quite fast, which yeah is against the principles of above 30 miles you need a separated bikeway right but as you can see there's literally no space right um, and what what they've done is instead of uh, instead of trying to maintain a very low speed they maintain a very low volume of cars right so the number of cars that travels here is very low in relation to the number of bikes which means that drivers automatically behave a little bit differently right yeah so sure legally they could drive 40 miles an hour but I doubt that mo many people do that, and once they encounter a cyclist, they all know to take care and slow down a little bit. Or right. not all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Most. yeah. Not all. Most. Most. We'll see if we can slow yeah. this guy down. The delivery driver will yeah. have a little uh, something to say about that. No, nope, we couldn't slow him down. No, I couldn't slow him down. I can't judge speed very well. It, was this, he traveling this was 60? Probably 60. Yeah, yeah that was 60. Probably That's wasn't what it felt speeding, like. but he yeah. was going quite fast. Yeah. Hello, geese. Yes. He's got oh, something to really? say about it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Lots to say. Yeah, I think uh, I think the goose had something to say about uh, he had that driver. Opinions. Yeah. He he thinks it's 40 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> now you were uh, talking a little bit a few days ago about um, the joys of this type of rural path. Mm. Yeah. I, I think this is a really underestimated or under underappreciated asset in the Netherlands where of course a lot of the cycling is done within the cities but the fact that you can literally ride from one side of the country to the other being fully confident that you will not get into a terribly unsafe environment at all right um, is almost incredible and it's, yeah. it's due to a lot of like this kind of treatment because we're you know we're out in the in the country now yeah um, but there's just such a fine-grained web of little forestry paths where it's still an active forestry area but they'll just have a little cycleway next to it in, in stamped dirt um, or little footpaths that they upgraded to shared use paths for example just a nationwide fine-grained network of that recreational um, cycle network makes it yeah, almost incredible that you can actually do that on a nationwide scale. We're currently working on a project to implement a similar system in Denmark, and it's, it just shows how, how much of that network already exists, but you just don't have access to it, for example, because it's a private road or a private path. Right. But also how difficult it is to get it to a, to a level where it's actually nationwide, embraced by everybody, and every municipality understands how 
how to deal with it, how to maintain it, how to maintain the signage, etc. There's such a almost invisible system of forces at play that keep that whole system intact. Yeah, uh, which is amazing. <laughs> And I think it actually does it a disservice for us to even use the R word, recreational. Yeah. Because in, in reality, oh, yeah. every single quote unquote recreational facility or pathway or trail, yeah. if it has connectivity, is also used for sure. from a utilitarian yeah. and uh, essential connectivity yeah. for people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it allows for a, a, a decent level of, of connectivity f on a bike from any small town in the Netherlands. Like they still have access to a lot of places. They might have to cycle a little bit further because they live outside a city, right? Yeah. To get to a theater or a cinema, but they can still do it. Right. Like you have that choice, and that's, I think, yeah, amazing to see. Yeah. Because the, the, yeah, the cycling really doesn't stop at the city edge in, in the Netherlands. It just keeps going. It, it does not need to. It does not need to stop. <laughs> uh, there's a little car. Now we see we kind of transition a little bit from what we've been on, which is a fully red sort of shared feet strut treatment to a short little uh, yeah. edge lane road here. Different municipality. Different municipality. Yeah. Different choices. A little castle. And sure enough, we can see some businesses up ahead, a little commercial area, a little church. Nice little drawbridge up here. And a little castle. Let's see if we can and get And really around. quite delightful. Very, very comfortable. As Leonard points out, just those pathways are quite pleasant to be on. We're gonna do a U-turn and turn into that side street there. <laughs> All right, so uh, just a quick little debrief on what we've done so far. Um, so, so, Leonard, we were just on this delightful little rural good. road. Uh, this is part of the good that good, you promised sure. us. We also went through a couple of really cool roundabout types of situations and in, in a, in a few older uh, contexts, less than perfect situations. Uh, before I have you give some commentary to that, uh, Jordan, what would you think of what we just kind of went through? Yeah, I mean, honestly didn't even realize it was like a cars and bike shared space until we finally saw some it felt I don't know it felt comfortable yeah um, I think it might have been easy to interpret the cars as coming a little too close to you if you're used to uh, like a US context mm. but um, I don't know people riding seem to be comfortable with it yeah. yeah. And in the earlier sections, we went through some roundabouts. What you, you, I mean, you and I love roundabouts, but you know, how, how did that feel for you? Uh, and we went through a couple of different types of roundabouts. Yeah, the one that sticks out is probably the last one, I think, mm -hmm. where we had priority the whole way through, and you pretty much are just looking to your left. Um, and we're, we're on the raised portion, so anyone coming off of there would have to already be uh, looking for us. Hmm. Now, I thought it was pretty comfortable. I've been on some roundabouts that are not so comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And also a little unclear about who's going to give way to who, yeah. uh, but not there. Yeah. And Leonard, from a design perspective, that last roundabout that Jordan was just uh, referencing there, you had mentioned that you know this this was one that they had you know just recently did, and, and we gave, got that separation. Yeah. Because uh, prior to that, we we just had a painted line. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what that roundabout would have looked like before they put it in like that. It might have been a signalized intersection, actually. We've mm -hmm. been taking out a lot of signals uh, and changing them into roundabouts from a, for a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and because drivers like to have that more continuous flow, so we also you know, it's also good for drivers if the traffic volume is not insanely high. Um, but yeah, the, fixing the, the, the intersections first, uh, if you have a limited budget, then that's definitely a recommended uh, treatment. Yeah. It's good stuff. All right, what do you have in store for us now? Yeah, now the bad and the ugly. <laughs> First, we're going to go through a little bit more rural uh, cycling uh, on the on the rural cycle network, passing a beautiful castle on the on the side, and then we're going to head into a little uh, industrial area, 
um, to see what an industrial area in the Netherlands looks like. It's quite um, different, I think. And then we'll move into an older neighborhood with a lot of high-rise buildings where the streets are hugely oversized, uh, that the city is really working hard on trying to, to improve. Uh, um, but it's just a very tricky um, yeah, challenge from an urban design perspective. Like the cycleways are still great. You just have to find ways to bring the street closer together and to create that crossing um, desire line basically because it's all islands of housing in a big sea of green lots of green beautiful cycleways really wide streets but it doesn't really have a lot of neighborhood character right right so it's a, a nice challenge for the for the dutch we yeah. still have a lot of challenges and i think it's uh, also yeah. good to talk about those because we're not we're not done we're not perfect in any way um, lots of work to do even on cycling um, but also in, uh, in terms of yeah regeneration of a, of a neighborhood without gentrifying it too much this is a yeah. big challenge here as well okay let's go do it let's do it all right It's one of those suburban uh, McMansions, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's what you get when you have a suburban McMansion that's actually a castle. <laughs> actually a castle. <laughs> yeah. So these kind of paths, they're still open to cars, right? There's still access to this uh, little farmhouse here on the right. Oh yeah. Um, but it's so narrow yeah. that it's automatically slowing everybody down. Yeah. Uh, even hard to negotiate two or three bikes at the same time, but it's all that's all intentional. And then here a little um, modal filter, movable bollard that only provides access to people that are allowed into this street. Right. And which makes it an extremely low traffic uh, <laughs> neighborhood, but not a not a cycle lane. Finally. And another activity asset here. We have some uh, tennis court facilities in one of those rural roads. You do have motor vehicle access on this. We saw that uh, retractable bollard, but you also see right over here the, uh, the walking path through the trees for a little bit of nature bathing <laughs> just outside the city limits. Little bike there parked. So another pretty narrow path. Actually, car access. So there's yeah. actually a car coming in the opposite direction. Yeah. So it'll be interesting and to see how see, that goes. And they see us coming. They see us. So Just have to negotiate. They'll the wait. Late. The negotiation. <laughs> Community gardens. Oh yeah. Oh well. Private lots, but at least that. And now we're back on a red path treatment. Yep. How would we uh, interpret this? This must be the old uh, road that has been here for decades, or maybe 200 years. 
because you can see the really old tree line, uh, willows, willows, mm. I don't know what you call them. Um, which usually indicates a very old street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still car access actually, uh, red asphalt though, so it's uh, indicated mostly bikes and only really maintenance vehicles for the for the sports grounds that kind of stuff and um, they can have uh, entry to this uh, to the street but yeah yep. managing volume is uh, is the trick here to make it a, a comfortable cycling experience by just having very Correct. few cars and we do note that we do have lighting here as well so this yeah. path is well lit um, probably giving access to some of those sporting fields as well exactly yeah the tennis grounds and the, there will be a lot of evening activity going on there um, and by making this this street um, mostly bikes you, you just get people to ride to the tennis club and so right. it's, just, it's just a nuisance to have to drive there yeah right? and these people all live probably relatively close and um, so they can all cycle so by just making it just a little bit more annoying to drive they automatically pivot to the bike yeah this little nudging behavior change by network planning Ah, there's that word nudge again. Nudge. <laughs> it's a little. Uh, this is good. It's talking my language. Talking my language of human behavior <laughs> and behavior yeah. change. You yeah. Gotta love it. And just making it like we, we're not stopping you from driving there. We're yeah. just making it easier to ride. Yeah. And I think that's just such a, a better way of talking about it. Okay, Leonard, so we just popped out of our delightful little rural pathway and we're... Boom! Where are we? Back what into the thick of things. Back into the thick of things. Um, so the Netherlands embraced the car as the, the way of the future for a while, like everybody else. Uh, and in that time, there was a lot of development uh, also in this area. So this is very much a car-friendly neighborhood. I would say wide roads, big long blocks, um, so long distance between the intersections, and then little islands of housing between. So very, yeah, not the typical Dutch development model where we currently build more traditional neighborhoods with row houses, townhouses, uh, on traditional streets with cobblestones. Here it's bigger scale housing and thus bigger scale roads. Um, and as you can see, very wide roads. So there's almost no connection between the sides of the road, which is a big problem, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it hard to cross, but also why would you want to cross? I might as well just get in my car and drive to where I need to go. So this is one of the neighborhoods that the city is trying to fix or improve, <laughs> not fix, but improve. Um, but it does have the same, I'm gonna turn right here, the same questions about gentrification, um, annoying the cars, the war on cars, those kind of, um, those kind of words are thrown around in this, this particular neighborhood as well. Yeah. They're slowly um, improving the, the land use. We'll see some of that a bit further down where they've redeveloped some of the older bigger blocks into different types of housing, a bit more variety, trying to mix it, mix it up a little bit. Um, which I think is, is a good thing, but it's still a long way to go um, to, to modernize this neighborhood and to make it more sustainable, more livable, and more prosperous. And we see that it, we have a baseline level of cycle infrastructure here. We see you know, moms with uh, cargo bikes and we see individuals in mobility yeah. devices getting around. So we still have that baseline level of facility yeah. of access, yeah. but in an environment where cars are clearly preferred Dominant. and exactly, prioritized. Exactly. So it's kind of more American style, mm -hmm. right? You're not, the bike is not the primary mode of transport in this, in this area. Mm -hmm. It's still facilitated, so I think this still, you know, it still has a decent mode here. Definitely much lower than other parts of the city but it's still pretty good. It's fairly, um, fairly safe in terms of uh, traffic safety, um, but it's just not, the, 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 the urban environment is not very inviting for right. cycling. And that's something that's so important. It's not just about the infrastructure, it's about your planning regulations, it's about your urban design. Um, how does the, the street 
address the, the land use another way around. Like, is there a connection? Is there destinations nearby? Um, can I hang out on the street and talk to my neighbors? Can you have a conversation with somebody next to you on a bike? Is there too much noise, etc., etc.? Yeah. So there's so many elements that make the difference between maybe a 5% mode share or 10% mode share and the insane mode shares that you see here in the Netherlands. Right. Um, and that's because all of those planning regulations work, well, most of them work relatively well uh, with cycling in mind. Right. There's a relatively big, big industrial area on the right, which has very little in terms of cycling provision. Don't like it there. But here and really, a there's, a, there's a big difference between being able to get around by bike and walking and transit mm -hmm. and truly feeling like you're invited and welcome. Totally, exactly, that's spot on. Yeah, that's, and that's exactly what this exemplifies, right? Some of the other infrastructure in Utrecht, like the, the, the rail trail thing in the east, it's beautiful, it's really inviting. The bike takes a prime position. In the, in the transportation network and in the, the street design. Here it's a little bit more, it feels a little bit more like an afterthought. Um, it's still good, like it's still decent infrastructure. I think any US city would kill for this kind of street design, but it's not quite in tune with what the rest of the environment screams at you. Like, yes, it's possible, but it's not encouraged or invited. Yeah. Right. So see, they're upgrading some of these, or renovating some of these uh, big building blocks to make them more uh, better insulation, a bit of a facade upgrade to, to make them a little bit nicer. And a lot of them are social housing, so they're owned by the uh, Social Housing Association, which is a good thing because they can upgrade all of the houses in one go. Um, and then you have you know, high quality, good, well insulated, um, social houses, which I think is extremely important. But it is also good to have a bit of a mix of um, mix of housing stock in a neighborhood like this. Like right. Not just social housing. It should be it should be a good mix. And that's something that we're always looking for in the Netherlands to to find ways to mix it up without gentrifying. And that's a fine line. Uh, now many cities globally are, are dealing with the challenge of homelessness and affordability. Yeah. I know Utrecht is dealing with affordability and lack of housing, but yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not really seeing uh, outward signs of massive homelessness. Is that partly because of the social housing system? Yeah, I, I think so. It's um, obviously a very complex subject, but there's not a lot of, well, relatively not a lot of forced homelessness in the Netherlands. Um, compared to other cities, for sure, like it's definitely not as visible. Can we pull up here yeah. and can continue that thought? It's not as visible here as in other cities where you have just a lot of people living on the streets. So there's a good safety net here and the social housing system is one of them. There's just vast amounts of social housing, uh, mm -hmm. like a 30, 40, 50 percent of houses are, are owned by the, by the Social Housing Association. And that's just a guaranteed base level of, of housing for people that really need it. It's never enough, like we always need a bit more. And there's issues with, you know, if you move out of a social house, where do you go then? Because free market rent is too high. So yeah, lots of issues on the, on the construction side, but that baseline safety net is there. And I think yeah. that's a big difference. Yeah. And it's such an important factor too, when we, when we think of housing and mobility, uh, there, there needs to be that connectedness yeah. and cohesiveness because one of the biggest challenges, especially from a North American standpoint, yeah. is the fact that too often, you know, a household is almost required to, yeah. to maintain one, maybe two, maybe even three motor vehicles yeah. within the household to be able to just exist. Yeah. And then that drives your affordability exactly. when you think of, you know, what you can afford yeah. from a housing and transportation perspective blows it out of the water. Yeah. This seems like this is, you know, part of what is, is happening from an intelligent design perspective yeah. of, of trying to make it easier for people who may be on, you know, hard luck and, and, yeah. and, 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 and or need yeah. a, a hand up yeah. to, to be able to access active mobility and transit. Yeah. Is, is, am I catching that? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, um, the, especially if you look at the cost of car ownership, uh, especially two cars is, mm -hmm. is probably about the same as you would pay for your house, which is, which is crazy. So not having to pay that 
um, makes it such a different calculation and, and that makes the difference between actual poverty and just making do um, and, and getting there and being able to afford your house and your school and your food and, and that, that kind of stuff. So that's uh, there's there's a very strong connection there, absolutely, and I think that's something that we're still underappreciating, even here in the Netherlands, where we say that that link is not necessarily always as explicit, where we say we build in the locations, we build social housing in the locations where you don't need a car, which is an added benefit, and that's yeah, yeah, it's a very important and hugely influential one. yeah part of the equation. Good stuff. Well, I've brought you here today because we have a rather interesting uh, transportation roundabout. Uh, roundabout here. <laughs> so, um, so this is the dimensions are a little bit different here. Uh, we uh, we see a little bit more of a true roundabout feeling to the the cycle track. Uh, why don't you walk us through what we're we're looking yeah. at here? It's a relatively large footprint roundabout because mm -hmm. the streets approaching this uh, roundabout are all quite wide mm -hmm. um, but what you can see is it has a, a few different features that, that, that make it work so well one of them is the, the raised platform for bikes so if you cross the bike path you go up a little bit uh, highlighting the, the place of the bike path for one but also slowing down the cars a little bit um, which is good. You can see the apron in the middle around the, the island, which makes it uh, a roundabout that's usable by large trucks. Like that one will have no problem navigating this, but also double articulated buses can, can do it. Um, it's, it's accessible to all vehicles. Thank you. Um, bicycle priority, obviously, which is a standard feature in all urban Dutch roundabouts, or should be. Um, a nice setback. So there's a bit of space between the circulating lane for cars and the bike lane so people have time and space to, to stop and look for bikes before they cross the bikeway. Uh, pedestrian priority, which is always nice. Um, a lot of people think that oh, it's a large detour for pedestrians when you walk from there. You have to walk a few meters out of your path to get to the pedestrian crossing. I always say, yeah, but you have full priority and you never have to wait. So to me, that's still a huge net benefit. Um, and it gives people space and time to stop, which I think is a, a crazy safety benefit as well. It's a little bit large for my liking, so I think it's still a little bit too fast, but it does work uh, relatively well uh, for, uh, for an intersection in general. One of the things I'm always fascinated by with, uh, with respect to roundabouts is, of course, how um, so often in North America and uh, Australia, New Zealand, and other places globally, yeah. where you know the roundabout comes about, it's it's a it's a okay, we're going to do it, yeah. we're going to make this treatment happen, and they they completely discount doing a roundabout. Uh, with just one lane in each yeah, direction, yeah. and they overbuild it. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, how, yeah. how do we how do we kind of break that initial addiction yeah. of just feeling like, oh, we have to do a multi-lane roundabout? Yeah, yeah there, that's a um, that's a good point. I think a lot of people, a lot of traffic engineers, underestimate uh, or overestimate how much benefit you get from a two-lane roundabout. Mm -hmm. If you have a two-lane roundabout, you really only get 30% more maximum traffic flow at peak. Um, a one-lane roundabout maybe causes a little bit more delay up front if you're at the, the, the higher threshold of what a roundabout like this can handle. But people are really underestimating how fluid it is, right? It's mm -hmm. not stop-go, so it's not... If you have a big intersection with traffic lights, everybody waits two minutes if the light's red. That's just yeah. the default. Here, if you have to wait two minutes, that's, that's like peak of the peak of the peak. That barely ever happens. So by only designing for that peak, peak, peak time, we think we need two lanes when actually it's the, the, the time savings are huge if you just do one lane but you have a continuous flow and like 90% of the time it will look like this and it'll be completely fluid and there'll be zero waiting time. So that's a, um, that's a big mind, sh mind shift I think that the traffic engineers have to do uh, to not design for the peak of the peak uh, and really assess the safety disbenefits of a two lane roundabout and take that into account because it is just significantly less safe. People are going to overtake within the roundabout. Um, people actually don't want to be next to a truck within the roundabout, so they'll wait anyway, mm -hmm. which means your capacity is gone regardless. So yeah, there's, there's all these kinds of more intricate design details in a roundabout that, that make it so efficient and that make a two-lane roundabout completely unnecessary most of the time. Yeah. 
I hear a lot of criticism uh, as well is that, uh, well, the roundabout is just a, uh, a an intersection that prioritizes the movement of motor vehicles and discounts, uh, you know, people walking and cycling. Yeah. I, I don't buy that. I, I, I think that it depends on the context of the oh, situation yeah. and the design. Yeah. I, as a person on a bike, I would yeah. much prefer navigating, you know, through a, a roundabout of similar scale and, and ensuring that the motor vehicles are traveling at, you know, non-lethal speeds exactly. than stuck at a light. Having to wait for a light, to me, also feels silly. <laughs> yeah. Like this, this design clearly prioritizes you as a pedestrian and, and, a, and a cyclist. Um, this is a completely zero delay option, uh, extremely comfortable extremely at yeah, low speed like you like you said which which makes the chance of something going really wrong uh, much smaller um, I, I'm a big fan of roundabouts the only the only caveat is that for larger cities in the US where you've built up so much uh, in your land use you've built up so much requirement for travel that you do have uh, 50,000 cars using an intersection in a day then a roundabout like this is just not an option so it, it is in a in a different type of setting uh, where you would use a roundabout in the, in the US than, than here maybe. Because this to us is an arterial. Well see, and I would push back and, and say that I think we have to stop in North America and other global cities of looking at what the current traffic counts are. Oh yeah. And simply say, no, we're gonna design our streets yeah. and design our intersections based on the community we want to have, yeah. not the community that we do have and not the, yeah. the number of traffic volumes. Totally. Because if we if we if we create something that has facilities that encourage the potential of a mode shift mm. then maybe maybe yeah. you know what's our magic theory of of traffic evaporation yeah it's like 20 percent traffic <laughs> will ev uh, just evaporate if you uh, apply some pressure and uh, raise the temperature a little bit right Price, water. apply some pressure <laughs> raise the temperature yeah. a little bit and then yeah. poof yeah the magic of traffic yeah. and there's definitely evaporation. opportunities for that i i don't see all of the major strode intersections looking like this in the near future in the right, US. Right. Uh, especially with bike priority, you have to be a little bit careful about where you choose your location, design right. it well for really low speed, uh, so double down on, on the speed reduction. But once you start, then you can pull that thread yeah. and then more and more can start popping up and then you can definitely uh, reduce the traffic volumes everywhere, get more people cycling. And then you're in a vicious cycle where, where we are now, where we're just starting to take out traffic lights yeah. and putting in more and more roundabouts. So we're surrounded by housing all around us here. Uh, yeah. Where is the nearest transit stop where people on bikes from here in this housing yeah. will be heading towards? Most people will probably cycle to the central station actually, which okay. is probably about two miles away. Okay. Uh, there's a train station about a mile and a half that way. It's only local trains, so it's not mm -hmm. as fast. Okay. Uh, there's also buses on this corridor every 10 minutes probably. So okay. Good, good quality transit, um, but giving people that option to ride to the central station in one go right. takes away one transfer uh, and gives people much better access to the entire country from this uh, right. train station. Because we're in the middle of the day, I think we're like late morning or something like yeah. that, uh, right around maybe 11ish or noonish, and uh, it's been mostly motor vehicles coming yeah. through this area. But I can imagine after school. Yeah. Uh, after work, we you know we're going to see uh, yeah. a much higher percentage of people Absolutely. on active transit. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and even now, for if you would compare this to any American city, right? Like you see so many people. Uh, that's always that still surprises me. Yeah. Uh, in the middle of the day, there's just so many people walking around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just yeah, having having the opportunity or seeing people making eye contact with people throughout your day is something that I think is really influential, not just on your mobility, but on a society, right? Yeah. I, I make eye contact with people that are not like me yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. And they're not just in other metal boxes blocking my way and making me slow down. No, they're walking with their children, they're riding their bikes, they're riding their cargo bikes. Little kids in their bike seats, it makes you smile and you're like, oh yeah, there's other people around as well having a good time. And it's all ages and abilities. All, literally all ages and abilities. Yeah. yeah, from zero to 80, Yeah, 100%. Which we just saw. Which we just saw. So, nice. okay, Leonard, so, yeah, all right, you've showed us the good and the good and the good. When are you going to show us the bad <laughs> and the ugly? Oh, that was pretty bad over there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to see a little bit more ugly uh, down there. But yeah, it never really gets that bad. Never really gets Not that bad. bad. Not from a North American no, context. No. I still have my gripes around a few streets. <laughs>
is always pretty hey, let's, good. Hey, let's swing around and take a look at this. I mean, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, it's beautiful, right? Yeah. So, like, it's very green. But if you imagine that there's neighborhoods on both sides of the streets, mm -hmm. they're completely disjointed mm -hmm. because there's not really a lot of crossing opportunities. There's not really a reason to cross. Mm -hmm. And that also, yeah, it's a little bit of a lack of cohesion of this as a neighborhood, I think. Right. So that's one of the really tough challenges that you have in this kind of neighborhood where you set it up with a lot of space. You're like, it makes it a really green environment. Yeah. But it is not well used. Right, it's not, this is not an activity asset that you would, uh, people don't go walking in this middle medium. So it's a, yeah, a tricky, uh, tricky challenge. Well, and, and, and part of, it's a good point. I mean, earlier we saw a middle medium that had a nice walking trail yeah. in it. This just doesn't have a walking trail no, in it, it no. or it doesn't have a park area. In it. Yeah. it certainly could be activated. Could be, yeah, yeah. You know, it could be something where we create you know, activity assets that help yeah. draw in and help stitch the, yeah. the, the neighborhoods together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it does, like you can see on this on this side, this is a whole hedge the yeah. whole way. So it's all greenery, so it's non-permeable. So really the only movement is in this direction, which I think sure, sure. is a key aspect of this whole neighborhood. It's all very much mm -hmm. intersection, then a long stretch of straight, and yeah. then an intersection again with very little it, see, it seems so. like that permeability could be achieved yeah, yeah, because yeah. there's nothing yeah. that I see no. over here that is inherently yeah. with a little Dutch ingenuity right. can't uh, fix. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. It's yeah. definitely fixable. Yeah, but it is a it is one of the challenges that's. That and when you now. and when you look at mature tree growth and mm -hmm. and the fact that you have this, it's a it's a heck of a lot better to actually have this asset totally. than to have yeah. this all be paved lanes and then Could try have been to eight create lanes of this. asphalt, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a much better starting point than it could be, but it's uh, still point. not perfect. Not perfect. <laughs> all right, yeah. let's go in search of some more perfection. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so where are we headed now? We are, well, more of this neighborhood. There's a big shopping center further down, uh, which is has a very large car park, but also a pretty good cycling access. So that's quite interesting to see. But also along this street, you can see the lack of permeability and it's really quite long distances to walk uh, to get to any actual destination for, for Dutch standards. Uh, There's a little, a little permeability yeah, there. We got your... Thing. Not much uh, passive surveillance. Uh, at night, you can imagine it's quite dark, even though there are street lights. But it's, you know, it doesn't feel necessarily very safe. And yeah, this type of housing, very Le Corbusier uh, style, big blocks. Yeah. Not the most inviting environment. They're very much big housing block, common green, big parking lot in front of it. And that's, uh, that, that's what makes the neighborhood here. So that's what they're trying to redevelop. And we'll see that a little bit further down, uh, what, they're, what they're putting in place uh, instead of some of these bigger blocks. Still big blocks, but very differently designed. Yeah. Much more access from the street, that kind of thing. Well, certainly this particular stretch felt incredibly comfortable to just cycle along yeah. because you're, you've got the mature trees you've got yeah. that green you didn't really feel the onslaught of noise from no. the motor vehicles yeah for it, sure certainly yeah, it didn't, from a cycling it certainly perspective wasn't, yeah from a cycling perspective it felt super super comfortable yeah um for sure clearly from a land use perspective you know here's mm. some parking in front of yeah. this uh, residential area here yeah. um i suppose we could be like looking at land use change and maybe yeah. okay yeah. what can we do to put some businesses along the way here exactly. and other things is that kind of what you're yeah, talking exactly. about yes get some activity on the ground get some more people got it walking so that's uh, like the, we have the five characteristics of a cycle network right um safety directness all pretty good on a on a stretch like this mm -hmm. attractiveness with the greenery sure cohesion yeah. right great but it doesn't really connect you to locations or destinations it's really it feels like a through route while it should be more locally 
you know, you should be able to stop somewhere and have a coffee, or you should be able to to see um, see some other people. Right. Yeah, it feels a little bit less urban than the rest of the city. So really, what you're saying is that <laughs> marginal it, criticism. Yeah, it, it's and really what you're saying is that it it was a flow through versus there's yeah. no flow to. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. no place there. No, there's no place. The yeah. place is all little islands. But here, now, we see some place. Yeah, exactly. Here's a library, here's the shopping center, uh, which is already a lot more... You can immediately feel the difference, right? There's more people on the street, you see more... There's more things to look at. Right. Um, and that variation in, in stuff to look at is quite a nice added bonus. And what's really fascinating about that is that was literally like 90 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we went from saying, uh, it's so close, and yeah. then boom, we're yeah. here. Yeah. Just like that. It doesn't take much, is it what it doesn't take much. It is really. No, exactly. It's very got, intricate. Yeah, it's little. very intricate. You've got some first level retail yeah. establishments, yeah. some places to eat. You've got some bike parking. Four supermarkets. You've got a supermarket with. Yeah. Lots of bike parking, some unfortunate car park in a the front. Lot of car parking. Come sure. on, guys. Yeah. Let's the, put that down the back, below or way in the back, more. you know. Yeah. We could do better. We could, we do, could better. do better. We could do better. But this is what but you see, get, that's right? The whole a big, point. big yeah. parking lot and people yeah. will drive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even in Utrecht, it's, like it's, yeah. uh, it's still the same. Yeah. There's, there's tons of supermarkets without any parking. Yeah. And nobody drives there. Surprise, surprise. And that's uh, well, I, ongoing. It's, it brings back one of the things I like to say is that, you know, humans are just, you know, they're going to take that yeah. mechanism, that mobility mode that is comfortable and yeah. easy yeah. and convenient. And if you make driving all those things, then it's a choice. Yeah. It, it, it not only is it, you know, it's even if you have an alternative choice, yeah. it goes back to what we said earlier. The, abil the difference between the ability and it being truly, yep. you know, welcoming. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Put so, the bike at the center and you'll yeah. get more people cycling. Put the car So the now center. we've made this in incredibly welcoming, but we also are balancing this with, we're also prioritizing and making this very convenient, yeah. being able to drive. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. A little bit of a tension there between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then this neighborhood is quite a lot of that tension, which is quite yeah. interesting, makes it a very interesting neighborhood. For yeah urban design perspective or an urban perspective. Yeah. And then here's some of the newer development uh, along this, this route, which you can see it has a brewery, brew pub at the corner, quite large, a lot of uh, apartments up top. Yeah. Um, but already opens up a lot more. There's a terrace where people can sit outside and have a beer. It still has a bit of tension with the road, which is very much flow and fast moving traffic. Right. But they did create a little yeah, a little slice of calmness in the busyness of the network. Here's another of those longer impermeable streets. So one of the things that, that when I think about North America and some of the challenges and some of those strodes and mm. some of those areas where uh, we have the sort of the love of multi-lane areas yeah. and I think about something like this so we've yeah. got multi-lane road yeah. but we've done what must be done yeah. to create a side path yeah exactly you're doing a lot of work in North America and around yeah. the globe I mean how, how do we convince more municipalities that doing you know getting people out of the roadway and onto these wide side paths. How do we how do we do that? Or how have you done that? How have you been successful? Yeah. A lot of it is political will. Mm -hmm. That's the first. Um, people at the top and at the decision making level, they need to understand what it means if they if they want to be going on this journey. Um, you have to set the right goals, the right targets, um, be okay with creating some level of discomfort for a few probably very loud drivers that will be very annoyed that you 
taken away a lane? Well, assuming you even needed to. Exactly. Because, you know, I mean, what I'm looking at here yeah. looks very North American context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a key thing. A lot of the time you don't need that second lane. Yeah. And people just build it just to be safe. But starting to take away some of those second lanes, even as a trial, you'll find that at least after, after a little while, those traffic jams, even if, if they do even exist, will have resolved themselves. Um, and you'll see that, it, that it's actually fine. Yeah. One lane can handle a lot more than a lot of people think. Uh, we have to move away from being on the safe side and maybe in 30 years we, the traffic model suggests that we might need a second lane, so we'll put it in now. No, move away from that, start building for the future that you want to have. So you yeah. say, we don't want more than 10,000 cars a day on this road, so we'll build only one lane. Right. It's as easy as that. Don't believe the traffic model. Well, and, and again, when I kind of look at this, this design right here, I, I think of a lot of applications in North yeah. America where maybe they had just an undersized, undersized sidewalk yeah. Yeah. off where exactly where this location is. Yeah. They could transform that yeah. into something that is much more multimodal yeah. in nature. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Especially in locations where you're not expecting a huge... Oh, sorry, this way. Right. In locations where you don't have a huge volume of pedestrians, then a multi-use path is, is fine. If you make that very nice, but build it to a proper standard, right? Build it to a cycling standard, not to a, uh, not to a footpath standard, I would say. Then that can be a super easy segue into getting more people to ride their bikes. Right. And we that sort of, uh, that fixes one of the, the major challenges that we face in many global cities, North America, as well as in Australia, New Zealand, and other places, yeah. in the UK even, is that conflict that exists, the tension yeah. that exists between drivers and, and people on bikes. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, oh, you're, 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 you're creating a, a, a high quality facility that gets space, gives space to yeah. um, people on bikes so that they're not in the way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's why Dutch drivers are so happy because they, they don't often get in conflict with a pedestrian or a bike because that's being designed out of the system. Right. right? Except for in this context. Except for this kind yeah. of context. It, yeah. And then, and then it's, it's okay because it's okay. the design dictates that it's slow. Yeah. It's slow. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Sure. In other words, there's the, there's the expectation that we're sharing space yeah. in this environment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I think that's, in, especially in the UK, but also a little bit in the US, there's a real reliance on, on the rules of the road. And when a pedestrian crosses or jaywalks um, or a, a cyclist crosses against a red light, people get really angry because they broke the rules. And in the Netherlands, that would be more viewed as a, it's more of a social construct. Like if I break the, the rule, but I don't inconvenience anybody else, does it even matter? No, not really. Right. Um, and having this kind of um, shared environment, here where you're fully relying on eye contact and social interaction, there's no rules that, that rule how fast I have to ride my bike here to not inconvenience the car behind me. Right. That's all much, much more of a social construct. And because we're used to that social construct, we're not as angry with each other. Right. Because it's a person-to-person -person negotiation, not a legal or you broke the rules so I don't like you anymore right. kind of uh, negotiation, which is, yeah. I think, a fundamental difference in yeah, how yeah. the system works. Gonna and the other way. thing, too, about the, the design is and rolling through that residential area right there with the yeah. the, the, the cobblestone or, or bricked street is that the design also is reinforcing from the driver, yeah. you know, the appropriate behavior. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. screaming, yeah. drive slow. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's just really annoying to drive fast. Right. It's noisy, it's, yeah. it's rattling, it's, it's not very comfortable. And there are lots of chicanes yeah. with yeah. bike parking. Exactly. And yeah, yeah. 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 So this is a bad road. Okay. See the truck? He braked just in time because it was not wide enough. Recycling to my house. Ah. 
obviously this is high on the list of upgrades. Right. Um, they're figuring out how this whole system in this neighborhood is working, the network. Right. But that is a very much substandard uh, situation. Right, right. A little bit tricky. Okie dokie. Show you a Vonir, a real Vonir, a Wooner for a, 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 a real yeah, one. A real one. Okay, a, a real Wooner. Here, here so we this go. This is still all standard, 30 kilometers per hour, um, default Dutch residential street. But right ahead, you can see the little blue sign with the the kids playing in the the house and the car. It's a Vonir, uh, no curbs, um, offset. Parking, so first parking on the right hand side and a little bit of parking on the left hand side. Some nicely placed bollards. You can see a completely flush surface with a footpath that's only identifiable by the different paving material. A mm -hmm. um, few parking spots in between, so it's still quite a lot of car parking provided. Mm -hmm. But a, a speed limit of 10 miles an hour, 15 kilometers. Um, and people can just expect children to play in the street bowls to roll across at, at any stage and it's quite funny how they used this treatment in this street but then a standard treatment on the other side it sh immediately shows the difference uh, where this was a bone nerf this is technically not a bone nerf uh, parking on both sides at the same time you can see the curbs very narrow footpaths uh, so bollard at the end so you know <laughs> nobody's gonna drive faster here right but it's uh, still a very different look and feel right. immediately. Yeah, yeah. And much more car parking and then, uh, yeah, more focused or, or car. The car still centered here. Right. While on the other street, the car just had to do a little bit of a chicane movement going up and down. That's quite a subtle difference, but a... Uh, yeah, I was just going to say very subtle difference, yeah. but yeah. at the same time, now that you pointed out, yeah. it's like, oh, yeah. You do notice that people behave a little bit differently in the okay. in the as opposed to this one. Yeah, yeah. Because this is a car space. Yeah, yeah. And beyond the curb is pedestrian space. Right. And in a, a, a well-designed Vonair, if it's quite different, it's just more fluid. Well, which is a, a really counterintuitive thing to, to yeah. embrace is the yeah. fact that that curbless street means that it really truly is people oriented space for yeah. everybody it's exactly. shared space yeah. and it, if it feels a little bit more uncomfortable yeah. that's kind of the whole point yeah and that's good for pedestrians right taking the separation away right is good for pedestrians if you get the vehicle volumes on it. right uh, that's the key. yeah if yeah if yeah. if yeah. excellent uh, we're here yay Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this ride along video with Leonard Now. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just hit that subscription button down below, ring the notifications bell so that you get notified of new content coming your way. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers.